Please take your Bibles and turn with me to 1 John 4, 1 through 6. As we continue on our series through John's letters. 1 John chapter 4, we'll read verses 1 through 6. This is the word of God. Behold, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard was coming and now is in the world already. Little children, you are from God and have overcome them. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. They are from the world, and therefore they speak from the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. And by this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Let's pray. Lord, your word is precious. It's special, it's unbelievable. And Lord, I know that we're often distracted when we come to the preach word of God. I ask that you would clear our hearts, clear our minds, clear us from biblical distraction, Lord. Things that would cause us to not see you in your word. Lord, help us to enjoy your presence this morning. Help us to revel in it as we prepare, Lord, to see your face even more clearly next Sunday at Easter when we exalt you, Lord, in a special, special week. Lord, give us illumination as we come to your word. Here I pray. Amen. The word discernment is defined as the ability to judge well or to have keen insight on people or situations. We exercise discernment every day, right? We discern if whether or not what we're eating is healthy for us. We use discernment when making financial decisions. And if we're honest, we're always evaluating and reevaluating our ability to discern. Um, I think if we're honest, no one discerned what would be happening now in the political landscape in the United States. I don't think any commentator, anyone had it right a year ago that they would know this is where we'd be in our two political party system with the constant rabble rousing of things going on. We make mistakes in discernment. We always reevaluate because we're always learning. Well, several decades ago, that's my son, (laughs) discerning right now what I'm saying. (laughs) Several decades ago, a mistake in discernment almost made a a radical change in the entertainment and the pop pop culture industry as we know it. Something almost happened, a lack of discernment that almost caused us to miss out on something culturally that is now considered to be a very big deal. Because of a lack of discernment, one of the greatest television shows of all time almost never made it to the air. Well, in 1988, two friends had the idea of doing something completely different. These two guys, for a television show, rather than have a set and do a, do a screenplay and everything, they wanted to walk through the streets of New York and just talk about whatever came to mind. In fact, they had the idea they would walk into grocery stores and make fun of packs of gum, make fun of the way things were shelled, just make fun and laugh about everything they possibly could. When they first had this idea of putting this show together, as it evolved, people thought this is the weirdest idea for a show ever. Just people talking to each other? How how can you do that? That's not a television show. So no one believed them. In fact, network executives said that it was the most unconventional idea they'd ever heard of. And it was too like anything else that had ever been done before. All the folks that watched the pilot in the first few episodes thought that the show was too weak. It wasn't funny. And even one commentator said it was too Jewish. Just a really strange show. They went on further to say that it lacked the community, and this will date us here in this room, lacked the community of Cheers, remember that show, lacked the family dynamics of, ready for it, the Cosby show, and even more strange, lacked the relatability of ALF, which was the number one show on television at the time. Um, Before we get too judgmental, we really can't blame everyone for being so critical. This was something that had never been done before, written by two men who had never written a sitcom before. Okay? 
The stories had too many scene changes, about five times the average television show, and they often left conflicts unresolved. And in fact, there was no major love story plot woven into it. In fact, the only female character was written as a male, as one of the guys. And the number one reason the show almost never made it to air, here it comes, was that when all other shows were about something, this show was about nothing. And of course, I'm speaking of Seinfeld. I'm not advocating the show, but I am saying there's something that was almost missed here culturally that ended up redefining how we think about television. It almost didn't happen, and of course, now we know it's one of the greatest rating television shows of all time. And the reason is that the evaluators back then lacked discernment. They couldn't see what was happening culturally so that people would enjoy just people talking about life together and talking essentially about nothing. So they lacked discernment. Well, our text this morning highlights the great importance of discernment, more specifically Christian discernment, something the churches that John wrote to sorely needed. The churches that John wrote to were were in a moment of schism, really because of bad teaching. False teaching had grown up among the churches, and people had begun to follow these false teachers. These false teachers were a group that professed a higher knowledge of God. They said they were academically superior and had even a special knowledge or direct leading of the Holy Spirit. And they tried to authenticate themselves by outer manifestations. They would say, look at the spiritual things happening when we teach. Look at the great crowds that follow us. And ultimately, the people in the churches had begun to accept uncritically everyone who claimed to be a Christian teacher. But in fact, many weren't. This would be the modern day equivalent of walking into a Barnes and Noble into the Christian book section, which if you've been in before, know that not all the books in the Christian book section are Christian books. All kinds of titles make it in there uh, that make many, many profits. And just as having a book on a Christian bookshelf doesn't make the author a Christian teacher, John is saying that neither does having a pulpit or having a following. Of people. So John is calling the churches to Christian discernment. In our text this morning, we're going to see two things about that. First of all, a call that John gives us in verses one through three to test the spirits. And after he gives a call, he gives us a course of action that we are to overcome by growing in the gospel. If you look at verses 1 through 3, we're going to talk about testing the spirits. John starts out chapter 4 by bringing an awareness of the prevalence of false teaching. We don't always think about this, and of course the culture then didn't either, that there were folks that actually could be gathering people to false teaching. Verse 1 says, many false prophets have come or gone out into the world. He's kind of reiterating what he said in chapter 2 when he said, many antichrists have come. This is nothing new. If you look in the Old Testament, you could find plenty of spots where false prophets were preaching, right? Prophets of Baal, the false prophets of Israel. There were plenty back then. There were plenty in John's time, and there are even plenty now. But how do we recognize them as such? You know, it's easier to think about us recognizing the false prophets of the Old Testament, right? We can see what they said now and see if it was fulfilled. But how do we distinguish And the problem with the churches that John wrote to is that they were trying to distinguish teaching based on worldly things. One of the keys was, had they gathered a crowd around them, right? So if a person had gathered a crowd, well, maybe they're they're a biblical teacher. And John says, that's not how we distinguish. They thought maybe they had an outer manifestation of the Spirit. We should follow what he's doing over there. And John says, no, that's not how we authenticate. Well, whereas in the Old Testament, we authenticated prophecy by fulfillment. We all know that. John is saying here, we authenticate Christian teaching based on two important things. The content of their teaching and the spirit lying behind it. The content of their teaching and the spirit or the source of inspiration behind their teaching. When it came to their content, the crux of what John wanted to know was, is this preacher, is this teacher preaching Jesus Christ, higher than everything, more beautiful than everything, more wonderful than everything. Was the teacher 
Christ-centered. And he's not just talking about a mere confession. You see, for John, it wasn't enough that a person said, I love Jesus, therefore listen to what I had to say. It was something much, much deeper. It was a clear, unmistakable, intimate knowledge and allegiance to Christ that a teacher had to have. So that this teacher would love Christ with their minds and love Christ with their hearts. When it came to loving Christ with their minds, the question John would ask is, do they confess that Jesus Christ has actually come in the flesh? And here he's teaching about a false teaching that we we call docetism, which is the idea that the outer world or the physical is essentially evil, and therefore God can't be physical. And so these false teachers would say that Jesus, yes, he's here, he came, but he only appeared in the flesh. He wasn't actually the son of God, like we think of him here today. And of course, that view has been condemned as heresy just a few centuries later. It's not enough that he simply appeared in the flesh, Biblically, we know that Jesus actually became man and dwelt among us. This is so important and so wonderful. The two doctrines he's talking about are the incarnation. That Jesus incarnated into the world, came close to us, dirty, filthy, disgusting sinners or sheep, and called his sheep to himself. And that he did so, he incarnated being fully God and fully man. And these are things that John had close, intimate knowledge of as he followed Christ. And so John is saying, yes, if they have the mind of Christ, I want you to ask this question of their preaching or teaching. Do they have a deep knowledge of Jesus? Is there a deep knowledge of Jesus in their hearts? Do they constantly talk about Jesus coming to earth, living a sinless life and being tortured on the cross? Is the resurrection a highlight of their sermons? Does the saying resurrection make this preacher smile and exude joy? And I know it seems like we're getting nitty gritty in doctrine here, but this is kind of an important lesson for us to think about is that doctrinal beliefs about Christ, they matter because Christ matters. In fact, one commentator said that a denial of the doctrine of Jesus is the denial of Christ. And so you could see how important it was that these preachers knew Jesus. And they preached the Jesus we know in the word of God. So they had a mind for Christ. They also had a heart for Christ. John would want to know, are these preachers, are their hearts on fire for Jesus? Is he their passion? If Christ is their doctrine, then he will be their passion. And therefore, John would say, he'll be their application. Are the preachers pointing back to Christ as the solution? And by the way, as I'm giving you these things, you should be filtering what I'm saying to you. Is what I'm saying biblical? Or or what Ben and I, when we preach, are we pointing back to Christ as the solution? So that when we talk about the the idea of shame, which we all talk about, we don't just point to you and say, "If if you deal with shame, get over it. Or if you deal with shame, do good things for other people and you'll feel better. We say, if you deal with shame, go to Christ, the perfect, spotless, unblemished lamb who took on all the shame of the world so that we can be free of it. If we came to you to talk about unrest or a lack of peace, and how many of us feel that from time to time, we wouldn't just tell you to take a vacation, although that's not a bad thing. We wouldn't just tell you that. We would say, go to Christ who gives us the peace that surpasses all the world's understanding. And if we talk to you about a continual habit or struggle in sin, we would point back and say, don't just try harder. Abide in Christ. Let him carry that yoke. So that's the content of teaching. And according to John, behind the content of teaching is a source of inspiration, or as John calls, a spirit. Behind every prophet or teacher is a spirit or a source of illumination. One commentator says, behind every teacher is a spirit, and behind every spirit is, listen to this, God or the devil. Those are pretty strong black and white statements. Those are hard for us to think about, aren't they? Those aren't things I like to think about. I don't like to think about being judgmental. And I don't know how to think about this other than saying, he's saying there's spirits here in the world, and they get behind teachers. And teachers are manifesting 
those teachings. And according to John, it's the Spirit of God, and as he calls it, the Spirit of the Antichrist, which according to verse 3, if you look down, he's already in the world. We don't think about the Antichrist a lot. We think about the Antichrist being the end of times, and we'll talk about that when we want to scare people or something like that. But he's saying that the Antichrist, the Spirit, is already here. And even more scary than that, John says, the Antichrist or the Spirit of the Antichrist is in the pulpit. That makes you nervous, doesn't it? That the Spirit of the Antichrist or the non God Spirit can be behind teaching that Christians actually go to. That's exactly what he's talking about here. One commentator said that Satan will stoop to any level to deceive people, especially going after God's children, which means that we have to be really diligent, don't we, in being discerning and testing the spirits. Well, I was very discerning uh, when I decided to marry DJ. She's not in here, so I can say that, and it's fully true, right? Honorable thing to say. Now, DJ is amazing, my wife, and when I decided to marry her, I had to do two things. I had to ask her parents for her hand in marriage, which is always awkward. Uh, It's scary. I don't know what to say there. And secondly, I had to find a ring, which is even more scary, uh, because I could speak for most men, I think, and when I say, when you walk into a jewelry store, we have no idea what's going on in there, do we? I mean, it's just, you know, what is, there's lights everywhere, there are things flashing. What am I supposed to get? And there's no course I took on this in college, how to find a ring or how to find a diamond. So I walk in, and who's going to tell me how to find one? The sales associates, right? And they would all show me around, oh, you need this one that costs $30,000. You need this one that costs $100,000. They, me, they, they kept saying, it. when people say it's three months of your salary, they really mean three years of your salary. They would say things like that. So I looked around and looked at different diamonds and tried to find one. It was, I didn't know what I was doing. It was kind of frustrating. I finally went to one store, and I, I looked around for diamonds, and the, the lady behind the counter showed me this diamond ring. I said, you know what? That one's kind of what, I, what I'm looking for. Um, and she is wearing this ring, by the way. Uh, she said, why don't you take it outside the store? So why don't I? Because I'm not a thief. I didn't even know how to answer that. Like, what do you mean? Why don't I take it outside the store? You going to arrest me? Um, she said, no, I want you to take it outside because no other store will tell you to do that. I was like, what do you mean? She goes, have, has, have they told you the other stores about the four C's of diamonds? Cut, clarity, color, and carrot? I was like, I've never heard that before. So they talked me through all those things. Took me outside and said, this shows the diamond in the real light. Because a lot of times you have to remember the lights inside a jewelry store are meant to detract from the real beauty of something. And then the lady said, let's take it under a microscope. I was like, really? So we did that and looked at it. And was, you could see all these crazy things inside a diamond that you've never seen before. My appreciation grew incredibly for that. And then this lady said, if you're not convinced to buy from our store, go back to Zales, Reeds, kept naming all these other stores. Go back to those stores and ask them, find the one you want, ask them if you could see it under a microscope or take it outside the store. So I did that, and no one would let me do it, interestingly enough. Um, and so she sold me uh, on that particular ring at that particular store. And you hear that story, and we, we smile thinking about um, that decision to make and how much I thought about it and stressed over it and tried to discern. Well, we all try to be heavy on discernment when it comes to things like that, correct? Things that are, we're going to spend a lot of money on, things you're going to wear the rest of your life. You think about it a lot. But we also use discernment when we buy a car, right? Or we decide what friends to hang out with, what churches to go to, or we decide where we want to eat for dinner. In Charleston, we're very high in our discernment for restaurants. We want to find the five-star ones, right? And if you boil it down, here's the reality. We discern things that we truly value. And we spend a lot of things, a lot of time discerning things that are beautiful. And the reality is there's nothing more beautiful and valuable than the gospel of Jesus Christ. That Christ took on flesh, died on the cross for our sins, lived in a perfect life in our place so that we can know him. And if that's true, then John's saying we should be discerning when it comes to the preaching we sit under, to the teaching we, we, we listen to, to the books we read. We should chew on it. We should savor the biblical teaching. We should seek it out and draw others to it. And the reason why John would say that is this, because when you sit under biblical teaching, it reveals and exalts Jesus Christ. Isn't that the reality? If you know Jesus, you just want a fuller love of him, don't you? You want a fuller passion for him. You want to to know him better. 
And the best way to know Jesus is to see him the most clearly. After DJ and I uh, got engaged, after her parents said yes, I got the ring, she said yes, it was great. We then had the stressful time of discernment to pick out a honeymoon location. Also stressful. Um, we wanted to go to the beach. And when we looked at the beach on, on, on the resort, and you've done this before if you picked out a hotel before at the beach, you have several options for rooms. We had a choice of the interior room, the garden view room, and the what view room? Ocean view room. Now, assuming that money wasn't an object and that you were going to do this one time in your life, which one of those would you probably choose? The interior, the garden, or the ocean view? We chose the ocean view. Why? Because we wanted the best view possible. And that's what John's saying. As Christians, we want the best view of Christ that is possible. And that comes through solid Christian teaching. Which brings us to our next big idea. We talked about a call to test the spirits. Now he's going to give us a course of action. And that course is to overcome by growing in the gospel. This is in verses 4 through 6. Overcome by growing in the gospel. And he's going to explain this by using three pronouns. In verse three, he, or verse, verse 4, he uses the pronoun you. In verse 5, the pronoun they. And in 6, he uses we. So he starts out by saying you, in verse 4, you little children are from God and have overcome them. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. What John is saying there is that you have a heritage if you know Christ, you are children of God who sacrifices greatly for your joy that you can know him. And if you are children of God, then you are brothers and sisters in Christ. I tell you, that is one of the neatest things about Christian theology, isn't it? That when you get married, you marry into a family, and you may know 20 or 30 more people that add to your joy. Um, when you enter into the body of Christ, you inherit a huge family that goes back generation after generation after generation so that you are a part of a spiritual family far bigger than the church walls you sit in, if you know Christ. And if you're a child of God, then you have an inheritance of hope already resting in your heart. It will come to full culmination in glory. He goes on in verse 4 to says that you have overcome them. And by that he means false teachers. He's saying that you, and he's speaking there to the churches that were sticking with biblical preaching, he's saying that you overcome, you overcame the false teaching. You heard it, took it in, and, and found it, something there wasn't quite right, something was off, and you found it wanting. You hear the echoes of Paul in this verse from 2 Corinthians 10, which when he says, We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God, and take every thought captive, you know that, every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. So we take things captive. We overcome. How? How do we do that? And he says that you are indwelled by one who is greater than, was in, than, than who is in the world. So we overcome through our identity in the Lord. We have a strength that's far bigger than any strength the world can show. And let me just tell you, the world shows its strength in so many ways that, quite honestly, I get intimidated by sometimes. And he's saying that your strength is far deeper, far stronger, because it's found in the Lord. That we overcame through the power of the word. And you and I overcome through the power of God. And we continue to overcome because, as verse 6 says, we have the spirit of truth. And the good news is, as a sidebar, is that it's not just that they overcame and we overcome teaching that is not biblical. We're also saying that we overcome really every obstacle that is spiritual if we're in Christ, not just the intellect. And I'm going to quote John's gospel on this one. Jesus said this, In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. That is something we have to remember. Because how often does the deck seem stacked against us? And remember, when Jesus said that, that he has overcome the world, what was about to happen to him? He's about to go to the cross. Even in the worst situations, we spiritually are overcomers through the power of God. As one commentator says, even at the darkest moment in history, which is the cross, 
there was a light that shone beyond the abyss of the cross. And we have that with us. John Piper even said this, uh, very controversial at the time, uh, because it was after 9-11, but he said that Christians always succeed. They always succeed. They never fail. And that, what do you mean? We, We feel like we fail all the time, right, if we're quite honest. But what he meant was this. That nothing spiritual, if you're in Christ, can ultimately win the day. You will always ultimately succeed, even in death. Which was a good reminder for the people that John was writing to. Because a lot of their friends had left the church. And they felt, where do these folks have gone? They're following people that aren't preaching Jesus anymore. And it's a good reminder for us. Because if we're honest, we deal with hard things all the time. We overcome through the power of God. The next pronoun is they. He says, they are from the world in verse 5. Therefore, they speak from the world and the world listens to them. This is a contrasted statement with Christians. Because Jesus said that he was not of the world and he called us out of the world so that we don't belong to the world. But these teachers, the they being the false prophets, they speak from the world. They're preaching from the spirit of error, teaching exactly what the world has gathered around for their itching ears, teaching that it's hollow and deceptive. But the discouraging part was that nevertheless, the world listened to them. They listened. They had gathered an audience from the world. And they had actually attracted weak sheep away from the flock of of Christ um, by, by dressing up hollow philosophy or deceptive philosophy, as Paul says, with with Christian clothes. That's what one commentator called it, dressing it up with Christian Closed, so that weak sheep were kind of attracted away. The good, no, the good news is that the last pronoun, though, is we. You, they, we. We are not from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. The we there he's speaking of is the apostles, those that wrote and spoke the word of God. The word of God that we still have today, the very words you're reading, which is why we don't need new apostles or or new sources of revelation. We have everything we need that is beautiful and wonderful in the word of God. And because of that, whoever knows God listens to the apostles. In this case, John was saying that the true Christians follow the true teachers, the apostles. And nothing has changed with that, by the way. Nothing has changed. Those who know Christ today still listen to, to the apostles' teaching that comes through the preached word of God. And this gives me a chance to explain. Some of you have wondered, why why do we go through the Bible book by book, chapter by chapter, verse by verse? Why do we do it that way? And the reason is that it's it's the safest way to stick to the word. That's what we feel. We feel like it keeps us kind of grounded in what the Bible said. So that when Ben and I study, when you listen, our elbows are always on one or the other side of the Bible, right? Right? And our ears are always focused in on the word of God. And then he ends verse 6 by saying, Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. They don't follow God's word because they're not God's children. And let me throw in an extra word on that sentence. They're not God's children yet. You see, we overcome. If you know Christ, you overcome through the power of God and therefore you cherish the Bible But there was a time when we didn't overcome, wasn't there? That we didn't know Christ as our Savior. That we were in the darkness. That we were looking, searching, trying to find answers. Thank the Lord someone didn't give up on us. Who invited us to church or shared with us scripture. The Lord leading us through the people around us. The reality is that through the power of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth, no one from a world standpoint is beyond the salvation of Christ. We are overcomers, and they can be overcomers through the preached word of the Lord. There's a ministry actually called the Overcomers in Greenville, South Carolina. We mentioned the upstate this morning. A ministry that's been around for decades now. And the Overcomers is a ministry that's made its mark by gathering men off the street of Greenville, South Carolina. Um, And they gather men who are on the fringes of society, men who have lost their families, they've lost their money, Many of them addicted to drugs um, or alcohol, and they have really no hope. They're just lost. And then they gather them in. They give them food to eat. They let them live in the facility for nine months. They give them a job. And many of them couldn't even get a job. Gave them a job. Gave them all that. 
and every week they taught them the gospel of Jesus Christ. It was an unbelievable thing when I first actually saw this. I walked into a group of men, about 100 men in there, who, big, tough-looking guys, I felt like I didn't really belong. I was like, man, these guys are huge. Um, and they, they felt different than me. And here they were listening to a, a man who was just preaching through John's gospel. And they were listening to what he had to say. The most remarkable thing about this is that they organized these men into a choir, believe it or not, and take them into various churches all through South Carolina so that these men who were former drug addicts formerly completely lost are singing about Jesus, many times singing old classic hymns, the old rugged cross. And people are just like, I can't believe this is happening. Why shouldn't we believe it? If God is who he says he is in the Bible, then there's nothing that can hold these people back if God calls them. So we have God's word. The question John would point to us and say, what are we doing with it? If we are overcomers in his word, who are we helping to know Christ? Who are we giving the repeated opportunity to hear the word of God? Who are we always telling about Jesus with? And that's why we do things like the Miriam Brown Center on Wednesdays where we tutor the kids. And they are crazy and they are fun. And I mean, it's just a, every time it's something new. Um, you should come with us on Wednesdays if you have a time in the afternoon. It's, it's an adventure, to say the least. And we're going to have a VBS for these kids in June. We'd love for you to come out for that. And all we're going to do is play games, feed them, share the gospel with these kids. The cookout at Dolores' house this week is meant to share the gospel by loving on people, spending time with them, being a light in the world. The Easter egg hunt on Sunday was not organized because I like hiding eggs, although it is fun, and I'm excited to see Alex enjoy it. It's because we want to see people enlivened by a sense of, why are these people building community? You know, building community isn't as popular as it used to be. People kind of like to be left alone. And here we are going riding to a neighborhood and trying to build it. It gives us a chance to share Christ. And that's why we talked about planting churches. And why, even though we're a small group now, the truth is our plan is to plant another church down the road. Because we want people to have a, a repeated chance to hear the gospel of Christ. So in closing, we are called to be discerning with what we take in, what we read, what we hear preached. We're called to test the spirits and to overcome through the power of God by growing in the gospel. Let me ask you, do you want an ocean front room or an interior view room? How close of a view of Christ do you want? And I hope that you would ring out true that I would say we want the closest view possible which according to John comes from God's holy word. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your grace and mercy. I thank you for the chance to, to hear your word clearly. I ask that you would help us to see it, see you more clearly. You should help us to desire reaching out to folks around us, Lord, that they might overcome like we have overcome in the gospel. Thank you for your grace and mercy and the power of peace, that you have overcome our shame, that you've given us a joy that far outdoes the joy that the world offers us, us, Lord. And you would give us a heart for people that don't know you, that we would burn with the power of the gospel to tell people about you in loving ways, Lord. Thank you so much for your grace and mercy. Here I pray.